I'm delighted to introduce our speaker tonight and to welcome him back to the 92nd Street Y. He is the best-selling author of Three Blind Mice, which has been called the best book ever written on network television. And another of his bestsellers is Greed and Glory on Wall Street. Since 1992, he has been Anal Annals of Communications columnist for The New Yorker. His latest book, The Highwayman, is an in-depth probe into communications, the world's fastest growing industry, and the explosion of new technology. He has a unique way of making complex material accessible to the general public in an informing and entertaining way. And after his talk, he'll be delighted to take your questions followed by a book selling and signing. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Mr. Ken Orletta. When she said um, author since 92 of Annals of Communication, my family said, you got to write, you got to write. Uh, it's good to be here tonight. And um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the communications business, but before I do, I thought I'd tell you a little story which happens to be true. And there was once a, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Henry Kaufman, who was the chief economist at, at Solomon Brothers. You know him? You, you're looking with nodding. He was once a gentleman? <laughs> anyway, Dr. Kaufman used to give a couple speeches a week. And after several years, his chauffeur once said to him, he said, you know, Dr. Kaufman, never called him Henry, he said, Dr. Kaufman, I have heard your speech so many times, I could probably give it myself. And so Kaufman looked at him and he said, really? He said, yeah. He said, this afternoon you will give the speech. So that afternoon, they get in the car, Kaufman says, give me your hat. They get out, Kaufman goes to the back of the audience with his chauffeur cap on, and the chauffeur gets up, and sure enough, hi, welcome. Sure enough, I'm telling, I'm in the middle of a joke. I'm not going to start it over again. <laughs> and Kaufman um, is, Dr. Kaufman is portraying the role of his um, chauffeur sitting in the back with a chauffeur's cap. The chauffeur is up there mimicking the speech that Dr. Kaufman always gives. And sure enough, he gives an absolutely flawless performance as Dr. Henry Kaufman. But they forgot one thing. What you're going to do to me, the question period. The chauffeur is going to be exposed. So some guy stands up in the audience, the first question, and he asks him a very convoluted, arcane question about the gold standard. And Dr. Kaufman starts to perspire, and he says, oh my god, what's going to happen now? And the chauffeur looks down at the questioner, and he says, that's the stupidest question I've ever heard. Even my chauffeur can answer it. <laughs> When it comes to the information superhighway, the bad news uh, I have for you tonight is that I know as little as the chauffeur does. The good news is that not many people know anything about the information superhighway, which reminds me of a scene that took place. This is a true story as well. Last summer at the annual Allen & Company conference in, um, where the hell is it, Helen? Sun Valley. I'm not there, journalists are not allowed to attend. Um, but all of these media heavies are there, from Bill Gates to Michael Eisner. And uh, Bob Wright, the head of NBC, is there, and Ted Turner, Turner Communications, Turner Broadcasting is there, and Sumner Redstone, the head of Viacom, was there, and John Malone, the head of um, TCI, was there. And they were on a panel. And the panel, the question of the panel was, what is the future and where is communications going to go? So Sumner Redstone, if you ever heard him, he goes on automatic pilot and he gives his speech, the future is via common software, we don't need distribution, blah, 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 blah. And Ted Turner, who, who gets around from the podium and falls down on the floor and tells jokes, and you never know what he's going to do, but it creates a sense of excitement because you don't. Uh, but he blah, blah about the future, and, and John Malone in his PhD in engineering voice, gave his blah, blah, blah in the future. And then Bob Wright's turn, the head of NBC, came his turn. And Bob Wright said, you're asking the wrong question. 
this is not the right question for this conference. And he looked around, he looked at Gates, and he looked at Eisen, and he looked at all these media heavy hitters, and he said, the real question is, where's Rupert? Rupert Murdoch was not attending that conference this particular year, usually he does. But by that question, what he meant is that if you look at the communications industry, everyone has their eyes on Rupert Murdoch, because Rupert Murdoch is the guy who is placing these big bets on the future. I mean, he's betting on satellite TV, or he's betting on Fox News, even though he has no distribution for Fox News, or he's betting on Star TV in Asia to distribute his programs. And you're talking about big bets. You're talking about a man who made a bet, invested $550 million in Star TV, before he had the approval of the Chinese government, and without even going to his own board of directors for their approval. Now he owns a billion dollars, almost a billion dollars worth of Star TV. So if you're in the communications business and you're one of these moguls, one of the things you do is you ask, where is Rupert? What is Murdoch up to? But there's a, there's a, a lesson in that question. And the lesson is that this business changes so fast that everyone is insecure when you think about it. Seven years ago, Rupert Murdoch and the News Corp was on the brink of bankruptcy. In fact, if a vice president at a Pittsburgh bank had not said yes to roll over a loan, Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation would have declared bankruptcy just seven years ago. And if you administered a truth serum to all the people who attend the Allen & Company conference in Sun Valley every year and all the people that I in my book call the highwaymen, you would, you would find that they all camouflage their fears by speaking in certitudes. What they do is they say that video on demand is the next killer app or the internet or push technology or intelligent agents. But you know, it's all an act. Because technology is changing so fast that there's simply no way to predict what consumers will want. Yet these highwaymen dare not admit this because they're afraid. They're afraid that maybe Rupert Murdoch knows something that they don't know. They're afraid of losing on the battlefield that they all know they're on and that will expand and get more fierce. They're afraid of Wall Street, which demands a level of certitude that none of them have, and yet they must pretend that they do have it. And they're afraid, frankly, of the media, which tends to be more interested in failure than success, and which also demands a degree of certitude. So any good CEO in the communications business wears a mask, a mask of certitude, but it's only an act. Perhaps it's a necessary act, but it's an act, because in the blink of an eye, everything changes in the information age we're now living in. Make the wrong guess, as for instance Wang did, when it bet against the personal computer for multimedia tasks, or as CBS did when it bet against cable, or as Apple did when it insisted on keeping its own proprietary software for the Apple system. You do that, you bet wrong, and you risk death. Change does not creep in on little cat feet as it did in Carl Sandburg's poem about the fog. Change does not wait for introductions. It strikes like a missile. Less than two decades ago, to give you an idea of the speed of change, there were no VCRs, and yet today, nine out of 10 homes has a VCR. As recently as January 1980, there were no PCs, no laptops, no CDs, no faxes, no Walkmans, no camcorders, no cellular phones, no CNN, no MTV, no World Wide Web. In an instant, our certitudes change. I begin my book with a 1992 account of Barry Diller's quest to figure out what the future is. And he had a little laptop, an Apple laptop computer. And he used it and he said, I figured out I could take this. He was not computer literate when he started, but he became computer literate and he had someone teach him how to use it. And he figured out that using this laptop, he had a fax machine, he had a Rolodex, he can communicate and be connected with anyone. He can take notes, he could send, send things, he can just keep in touch. And he used that, and I use this as a device in this piece about Diller, Search for the Future. He used it and went around and talked to various people in the communications business. This is 1992. 
And he decided after interviewing, going to Microsoft, speaking to computer people, going to Consumer Electronics Show and talking to people in the consumer electronics business, going to talk to the telephone companies and the broadcast companies and the cable companies, he decided that the future rested with cable, that cable had the, the best distribution system, cable had vibrant cash flow, cable had people who were technologically driven and therefore had some advantages, and he thought the cable had a kind of monopoly in local communities and that cable would be king. And that what cable needed was what Barry Diller would be very good at doing, which is providing a kind of a software mind, a guy who would run a Hollywood studio who knew how to do that, had built the Fox network, had built helped build ABC. Well, two years later, after Barry Dillon made, made his bet, cable is no longer king. In fact, two years after Dillon made his bet with and joined TCI and the other cable companies, the assumption was that the telephone companies were going to be king. In fact, if you remember, several cable companies actually either merged or tried to merge with telephone companies, thinking that the telephone companies had these deep pockets, these pools of cash, and had all the, the switching and billing expertise that you really needed to do this, but particularly had the cash that cable came to lack it for many reasons, including government re-regulation. But in any case, the paradigm, 92, cable is king, 94, telephone is king. 96, is telephone king? The silly telephone companies thought they can get into the, into the video business. So they set up and they spent a couple hundred million dollars in New York and to set up a tele-TV and they spent even more probably with these four baby bells joining in California with Disney. Have, have you seen one program on, on, on your telephone line? And I suspect you won't. Because what happened was the telephone companies, these people who had been a regulated monopoly their entire careers, suddenly said, what are we spending hundreds of millions of dollars on video and, and software, which we know nothing about, when we can get into the long distance business if we're the local, or we can get into the cell cellular business. So they changed. And they look, in fact, in a weakened position, though there are some people who think they will come back because of the deep pockets and switching, and in fact become king, potentially, once again. A few years ago, I tell another story in this book, I interviewed uh, Gerald Levin, who's the chairman of, and CEO of Time Warner. And at the time, this is early 94, Jerry Levin was saying, I'm going to spend $5,000 a customer to create video on demand in Orlando, Florida. 5,000 customers. They're going to spend many billion, millions of dollars on doing this. And this is going to be the new killer app. And I went down there, and I, I did this piece on, on, on this new killer app. But one of the things they did, they let me attend their market research sessions, and they had, and all these Time Warner executives are behind this glass, and they're watching this woman try and operate this mouse to do news on demand. Uh, it was in, they called it Pathfinder. And she's doing it, and she looked like Gina Davis, a very good-looking woman who, who was very presentable, and they said, God, we can do TV ads with this person. They were getting all excited, these Time Warner people. And then this, this trained coach says, not a coach, but a, a trainer who, who's sitting there and taking her through this, and she said, how much would you pay for news on demand? She said, I don't know, this is wonderful. I would pay anything to be able to get the news I want when I want and not have to wait, or maybe I missed it at 6.30. I, would you pay $10? Oh, absolutely, I'd pay $10. Would you pay $15? Absolutely. Would you pay $20 a month? Absolutely. And the Time Warner people are saying, wow, this is great. This is a killer app. And would you pay $25? I think I would pay $25. So they're all sitting there. She's finished, and they're applauding this, saying, wow, this is great, guys. These are top executives being acting like fools. And so I slip out, and I go see this woman, and I say, can I, excuse me, I'm with the New Yorker and I'm doing a piece. Can I just ask you a question? I said, it really doesn't matter to you? I mean, you between 15 and 25? I mean, that, that, you're cool with that? What do I care? I just have my lawyer do it on my trust fund. <laughs> a typical customer, they thought. So in any case, if you read the papers last week, Time Warner closed its Orlando experiment. So. When we speak of interactivity today, we no longer speak of video on demand or 500 channel universe they do. We speak of the internet. In a couple of years, the paradigms changed. One moment, for instance, John Malone is a genius. Now he's said to be a bum. I suspect he's neither. Um, one moment, Netscape stock goes through the roof. 
and today it's in the basement. One moment, proponents of cyberspace like George Gilder, he's one of my favorite uh, idiot savants, <laughs> because he insists that, in fact, all of us want to sit in front of a computer and we want to program it and type in all the things we want. We don't want to have people tell us what to watch or, you know, at 9 o'clock. No, we'll do it ourselves. We want to go through the labors of doing all of that work all by ourselves, and we can figure it out as, as complex. Because George can figure it out. He assumes that most of us are either as smart or as much of an idiot savant as he is. But in fact, that was the paradigm that the computer companies told us would be the case just a couple of years ago. That's what they claimed we would want to do. In fact, if you listen to the people in the computer business today, what do they talk about? They talk about a channel universe. They talk about push technology. They basically talk about replicating the broadcast model so you can get the stuff sent to you you know, deliverable in packages so that it's simple, user-friendly, and not as complicated as George Gilder, for instance, and many of the geeks who are programming this stuff. I mean, it's like when you go to Consumer Electronics Show and you see all this great technology, you know, these little handheld devices, but you can't see the screens, and the, and the keyboards are too small to, for your thick fingers to fit. And it's really designed by engineers. Well, George thinks like an engineer. And the truth is, people don't always obey or conform to George's, you know, whims. For a reporter like me, when I think of what's going on in the, con in the communications revolution or the information age, I think of the Wild West. Among the highwaymen, these people who are trying to rule this Wild West, there's a lot of bluster, a lot of macho posing. One week, the new cowboy to watch is Netscape. The next today, it's Microsoft. All around us, people are getting shot. In August 1995, this is the worst terror I had, which tells you what a great job it is to be a, a journalist. That is to say, you have power without any responsibility, which is wonderful. But I went out to uh, a summit. I, 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 I went out to a summit that Murdoch and Malone were holding in Denver. Colorado. I was doing a profile of Murdoch at the time, and some reason they, they let me sit in this summit, um, which I thank them profusely for allowing me to, to do, and I, I was taking notes, and there were three, three people on Murdoch's side of the table and three on Malone's side, and they were talking and talking and talking about dividing the world of communications. How, how are you doing in Japan? How are you doing in Europe? What are we going to do in England? How do we avoid bumping into each other in Brazil? That, that, the kind of talk that powerful nation state, heads of nation states have, and I'm sitting there saying, this is great, and I'm taking notes, and it's on the record. My worst problem was that I had to go to the bathroom, and for four hours, I'm sitting there taking notes, and I'm saying, if I leave the room, they'll never let me back in. So that's my worst moment, but the truth is, my terror pales against the everyday terror of the people involved in communications. The broadcasters, they worry about the cable industry, who worry about the baby bells, who worry about long distance telephone carriers, who worry about Microsoft and Intel, who of course worry about the internet. Publishers and journalists like me are terrified what happens to print. Universities worries, worry about what happens to their campus, because if you think about it, if you're connected, why does a student have to go to the campus library? They can retrieve the information on their computer. Why do teachers have to be on a campus? They can do distance learning and lecturing, and in fact, make more money potentially, lecturing not just to one campus but to, or one university, but to many. But if you think about it, if you logically follow it, universities have a lot to worry about. Not that you will decimate campuses, but you may take the profitability, profitability out of many of them, so that they will have to close some operations that they now maintain. If you're Walmart and The Wiz and Barnes & Noble, you have to wonder what happens to your stores if, in fact, consumers have direct access to the customer and don't have to go through the middleman of a Walmart, let's say, which, of course, in, in their turn, replaced a lot of other former middlemen who were smaller, who could not operate with the same efficiencies. We all wonder, when we think about the information age, are there any certitudes in the world out there? And actually, I want to suggest to you tonight 
that there are some certitudes, and not all of them are comforting. Though mine won't compete with Wilson's 14 points, or perhaps not even David Letterman's top 10, I count at least 14 certitudes that are useful maps to keep in mind when we think about what's happening to the communications business today. Certitude number one, every company strives to take the risk out of capitalism. In addition to the Wild West, another metaphor that might work to explain what's happening is 19th century Europe. If you remember 19th century Europe, you had, a, you had a world where you had no one superpower, but you had a number of nation states all vying to become superpowers. Today you have seven industries that are competing, striving to become superpowers, and yet none of them are. Cable, broadcasters, studios, consumer electronics, computers, publishing, and I'm leaving out one. No, satellite, well, satellite I'm actually putting as, as part of another group. It's um, studios, broadcasters, telephone company. Did I say telephone? Satellite, you can, put, you, can, you can count them as a seventh. I would not. I mean, among other reasons, they're not large enough yet. And you think about them. I mean, Murdoch, the telephone companies, AT&T owns a major piece of DirecTV. Uh, Murdoch is trying to put Malone owns major satellite. Um, but what you see there is that they're all seeking to become powerful nation states, and they're all seeking to become aligned with various people, which is why you see, read every day about new mergers or new alliances that are taking place. So you see people trying to use their power. Disney, for instance, uses the power of its newscasts and its Good Morning America to try and promote people to watch the Ellen show when Ellen flies out of the closet, as she did last week. Well, you see Murdoch, how he erects these satellite, direct broadcast satellites around the world, which is really, as he told me once, an attempt to leverage the power of his satellite distribution, particularly Sky in Europe, to try and get access to the cable networks here, for among other things, his, his news, uh, Fox News, which does not have a lot of distribution. Each company wants to minimize the risk of capitalism by controlling every aspect of its business from the creation of the idea, to the manufacture of it, to the distribution of it, and to its afterlife. The bad news, for consumers at least, is that there will be too few global communications giants, and thus there is a risk of too few sources of information. The good news, and this leads to a second certitude, is that George Orwell was wrong, at least about this. Technology, as he implied, is not a friend of monopolies or of government. Look, for instance, at the role that TV, satellites, faxes played in breaking down the Berlin Wall. Look how China, try as it may, cannot control the Internet today. Borders are made porous because of technology. So in that sense, Technology is not an ally of the Chinese government or any totalitarian government, nor is it the ally of Disney or any other large company. The truth is that technology should be our ally, the consumer's ally, because it gives us an ability to have many more choices than people who wish to take the risk out of capitalism would want us to have. Certitude number three there will be both more competition and less. On the one hand, each of these industries prepares to war. Phone companies ready to enter the cable business, cable readies to challenge the baby bells and the broadcast stations, and at the same time, every company hedges its bets by seeking to make allies. Think of some of the familiar headlines. MCI invests $2 billion in Rupert Murdoch's News Corp, which is something that probably pull back on. Um, AT&T enters the video business by investing 20% ownership in DirecTV, the satellite, the largest satellite distribution in the United States. Microsoft invests money in both Web TV and in MSNBC, a 24-hour news and online service, just to mention a few. For the citizenry, the menace is that these highwaymen will agree to spheres of influence. 
You stay out of my cable area, I'll stay out of your telephone area. You stay out of India, I'll stay out of England. Thus, the promise of more competition contained in all of the talk and legislation about deregulation, both here and abroad, there is a danger that, that this will not result in the kind of competition that governments promote and business promotes. On the other hand, it may. For instance, the price of long-distance telephone calls, in fact, are going down. There was just an announcement the other day that AT and T had agreed to a rate cut that will lead to 15 to 25 percent rate cut on long distance. And of course, the other MCI and Sprint and the others will be forced to follow. Look at what's happened to the computer prices or computer printer prices. They've dropped dramatically. Uh, so inevitably, uh, there, you have these two contradictory trends taking place. And which will supersede the other, or will they? I don't know, nor does anyone else. It's not a knowable fact at this point which leads me to certitude number four. As a set of nations, there are no permanent allies, just permanent interests. That's why an ally in one venture or country can be an adversary elsewhere. Think about it. One week, MCI enters a joint internet venture with Rupert Murdoch, who they supposedly are partners with because they invested $2 billion in his business. And yet the next, they dump Murdoch in the News Corp, and they, and they start an internet venture with Microsoft. Malone's Telecommunications Inc., the largest cable operator in the world, is a fierce opponent of U.S. West, which is the baby bell in, that, in the western part of the world that, that TCI operates in, and yet they're partners in de developing cable system for England. Universal and Paramount Studios compete in the studio business, and yet they're partners, 50 percent owners each, in the USA network. Hearst and Disney compete in the magazine business and yet are partners in ESPN. Certitude number five. The battlefield that these companies play on is global. Communications companies no longer think of themselves as bound by national borders. In fact, if you talk to them, they talk always about how is this movie, for instance, going to open overseas. They don't just say, how is it going to open in Cincinnati anymore? And if you look at the studio's revenue charge, most of them, there are a few exceptions. Paramount, for instance, is, is still an exception, though they're struggling and they, they promise this will change. They're getting roughly 50% of their profits from their movies from overseas sales, not just from American sales. And if you want to know why so many of the movies have, are, are violent, even though PG movies tend to do better in the United States, the answer is that they, those are the movies, the violent movies, the, the movies with sexual innuendo, are the movies that best cross borders and are most easily translated. You don't have to have the language barrier when you have sex and violence that you do when you have, you know, the English patient, which, by the way, interestingly enough and somewhat contradictorily, is doing pretty good overseas, at least in most markets. But that suggests another truth, which I'm, I didn't plan to mention, which is that quality may sell sometimes. It certainly does in that case. Certitude number six, again a contradiction. While the contest is global, the battle between these companies is often fought locally. In this sense, another icon was wrong, and that's Marshall McLuhan. We witnessed not the rise, as he predicted, of a single global village, but the rise of hundreds of local villages. American tourists may like to turn on their hot hotel TV sets and get the latest football scores or ask, as I did earlier, did Rick Pitino sign with the Celtics? I take it he did, right? Got 70 million. So sports pages were right today when they said that. God, it's amazing. Uh, in any case, we may like when we go overseas to to plug into American ball scores to find out what's happening, the latest, uh, if we're, it's during the campaign, what happened between Clinton and Dole today. But if you're a resident of India, you want your cricket scores, not your football scores. And you want to see your local weather, not your U.S. weather. And you want to see a local anchor, not an American anchor. And you want to see local news, not news from America or international news in the same way that, say, CNN presents it. So 
While McLuhan foresaw that, that, in fact, it was possible that citizens would share a global village, and we all did, for instance, in the Gulf War in 1991, where we all witnessed and shared McLuhan's vision. We, together, we watched that, that war on CNN and the networks. But in general, because of technology, things like handheld uplinks, you can localize news all over the world. So CNN is probably not the model. You're going to probably have a model where you may have CNN, but they're going to need local, lots of local partners. And therefore, you, CNN's vision or Ted Turner's vision of an all English, all news, worldwide news service is probably a thing of the past. And he will succeed only if he hooks up with local partners, which is something, something that Ted Turner has difficulty adjusting to. Certitude number seven. However local the battle, the companies that will survive are those who define their businesses broadly. The railroads atrophied because they thought they were in the railroad rather than the transportation business. The networks declined because they thought they were in the single channel business and didn't understand that they were in the entertainment and information business. Thus the danger, for instance, if you were the New York Times, I noticed that Arthur Sulzberger Jr., the publisher, is coming, and I, I know he's actually acute on this issue. He's aware of, of this danger. The, the danger for the New York Times would be to define themselves as in the newspaper business as opposed to the news business. And, and he, in fact, I've heard him say this. He says, I don't care as long as people pay for the information or advertisers pay for the information. How they get it is immaterial. I, I, in fact, it would be better if I took down fewer trees to provide it for them. And it seems to me that is, in fact, the way you have to look at your business. Um, if, if you're in the newspaper business, let's say you're in the news business. Certitude number eight, don't ignore the human factors. While covering Watergate, Woodward and Bernstein said, cover, follow the money. And they obviously were proven correct. Yet in covering the rash of mergers and acquisitions and firings and, and headlines in the communications business today, I think it would be a mistake just to follow business factors or just to follow the money. As a journalist, for instance, I learn a lot looking at people's walls. When I walk in Ted Turner's office and I look at his wall, what do I see? I see every magazine cover that Ted Turner, Ted Turner has ever been on the cover of on his wall, prominently displayed. And I see when you enter his office, an office that literally you almost need to hail a cab to get from his desk to the seating area. It's that large. That, I think, tells you something about Turner and his rather expansive vanity and self-respect. If you go to Rupert Murdoch's office, on the other hand, what do you see? You, the pictures, the only pictures on his wall, are not of all the prime ministers and presidents he's helped elect by using his newspapers and media power. It's not of all the stars and starlets that he knows as the head of the Fox Studios out in Hollywood. It's not of all the proclamations that he's received. The only pictures on his wall of an all-white office, both in New York and, which is interesting, I don't have an answer for why it's all white, but the only pictures you see on Rupert Murdoch's walls are of his family. Now, for me, that tells me this is all that matters. Business, because on one wall you see all his newspapers from around the world with their loud headlines, which he really cares about. But then you got these quiet pictures of this quite lovely family. But that's all that matters to him. He doesn't care about Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher or, or, or Tom Cruise. Those are ephemeral characters in his life. I think you learn something from that. You go to John Malone's office, you see that no phone rings in that office but one. There's one person who has a line, which is in a, the phone is in a drawer in his desk, and he opens it up. And it's his wife. And you learn something about why John Malone has, has behaved, had done some of the things he's done over the last few years, disappearing for long periods of time. And I wrote a piece, which is recounted in this collection, where John Malone basically tried to engineer a merger of his company with Bell Atlantic, in part because his wife was on his case, that he had not fulfilled his marriage vow in the sense that he was not home and not giving the time to the family that he had 
once vowed to do. So here's this incredibly powerful, incredibly smart man making decisions in part, at least, to placate his wife. Something that you don't get if you just look at the numbers of, of, um, of TCI, and you don't get if you just attend a press conference. So again, it suggests a level of complexity or human truth that's real important. If you look at Viacom, why did Sumner Redstone last year fire Frank Biondi, who is his CEO? Did he fire him because Frank Biondi was incompetent? because he wasn't producing for, for Viacom? Of course not. Was Michael Fuchs fired as the head of HBO by Jerry Levin because he was incompetent? He had built HBO into a colossus. Was Jeffrey Katzenberg fired by Michael Eisner because he wasn't doing a good job at the Disney Studios? Of course not. So what you learn is you have to understand and, and see those human factors. The problem or the limitation that journalists often have is that you got to get in the door to do that. And it's often very difficult to get in the door. So these human factors that I'm arguing are, in fact, important in understanding what is going on are often the most difficult things to get. It's very easy to get the numbers, particularly if they're good numbers. And it becomes a real problem for journalists in, in trying to puzzle out what is really going on. But if I'm right, and I think I am, about the human factor, we need to know more about why people are behaving the way they are, and we have to look beyond the simple business factors. Certitude number nine. The science of the so-called information superhighway, or cyberspace, we pretty much know. Soon science will have mastered the switch, uh, inter digitalized interactive network we've come to call video on demand. Access to the internet will be a less fearsome process than it is today. The sophisticated set-top boxes will be ready. The complicated switching devices will be perfected. High-speed modems will be in hand. The video on our computer screens will be able to be as crisp as they are on TV screens, high-definition high TV screens. The era of 500 channel choices will be upon us, or perhaps one channel that can get anything at any time. Children will be able to travel to distant places, Egypt, without leaving their home. Doctors will make electronic house calls or instantly send x-rays to another doctor for a second opinion. Smart wallets, wallets will be manufactured that will free us of the responsibility to carry cash or credit cards or keys. In fact, you'll be able to go to an airport. I mean, technology will be here to do this. Whether we actually do this is another question. But you won't have to stand on lines at the airport. There will be a machine that will be able to read your smart wallet. Yeah, that is kennel letter. You can go right through instantly. I mean, they'll just pass you right through. While we know the science, however, the great mystery, and this is certitude number 10, the great mystery is the consumer. Do people want to? program for themselves? Or do they instead prefer, as I suggested in my George Gilder example before, do they prefer collapsing in front of their TV sets and letting network programs or someone else decide what they can watch at 9 or 10 o'clock at night? Do consumers want to sit in front of their computer screens rather than their TV screens? We know consumers want convenience. Just look at the growth of credit cards or bank teller machines. What we don't know is what video or consumer or computer services the consumer will want. Will consumers accept the metered pay-per-view world or pay-per-use world that all of these highwaymen would prefer us to, to take? It gets pretty expensive. And how are they going to hide it on your bill? You know, the, the way they hide it on your video bill, you ever notice why you can't have a charge account at the video store? You know the, why they don't do that? Anybody know the answer? They don't want you to know how much you're spending. They figure it's painless if you spend $2.95 or $3.95 each time you go in to rent a video. But if you saw at the end of the month, in fact, you were spending $30 or $40 a month on a video store, plus the cable, plus any other subscriptions you have, it may scare you. So one of the things they talk about in this pay-per-view world is, what if we did it this way? What if we said, Time Warner has, has your, has your line 
and you pay us the monthly charge and we'll figure out what it is. But then we got this problem, we want you to use our cable modem, right, the high-speed modem. How, do we put that on the Time Warner building? Isn't there some other way we could do that? And then if you order from home shopping or you order from some catalog, does it have to come as part of your Time Warner bill or why can't we get, have the catalog company charge you so you get a bill from them? And then they're, they're caught in this vice because you as a customer would like one bill. It's easier. They as a provider don't want you to have one bill because they don't want you to see how much you're, you're really spending. And yet we don't want to have four or five or ten different bills each month. So it becomes, it, it's a nice little problem that, that hasn't been solved. And one of the ways they may try and solve it for us is to say, hey, we'll subsidize. If you allow us to have act, total access to your computer or TV, your buying habits, your viewing habits, and let us sell it to the advertiser. We'll give you a lot of this stuff for free. So then the choice you will face as a consumer is, are you prepared to cede some of your privacy in return for lower monthly charges? Certitude number 11. We don't yet know, obviously, the social and political consequences of the information age. Will we create two classes of citizens, the information haves and have-nots? What are the consequences of a society in which only 5% of low-income people have computers? What do we do, if anything, for the 90% of the classrooms without access to a telephone, which, of course, is the essential connection for a computer? and the internet. Who pays to subsidize classrooms? The taxpayers or the companies? And with unlimited communications and entertainment choices, will more Americans shuttle themselves indoors, thus avoiding face-to-face -face social in intercourse? Will rumors receive instant circulation as they did with Pierre Salinger on flight 800, for instance, the TWA flight, where he said he reported what was on the internet, which of course other people knew, but in fact it is very easy to disseminate rumors. Certitude number 12, the marketplace alone will not determine the outcome of many of these battles. Government has a major role to play. Government will decide, will they bring an antitrust suit, for instance, against Microsoft? China will decide, will they continue to oppose Murdoch's Star TV? or cooperate? Will Singapore deregulate the internet or will they continue to insist as they do, as by the way Egypt does, as by the way Iran does, as do other nations, that they will try and license all internet providers and control the internet that way? Will France and Spain continue to insist, for instance, on content legislation, which, which basically tries to restrict America's ability to sell programming and movies to in France and Spain? And will these restrictions of government create a kind of a trade war that will upset this vision of this global marketplace? Certitude number 13. As powerful as government and companies get, journalism will also continue to retain some considerable power. I'm often asked why people talk to us. Why do the people in that book why do they go out and they talk? And, and, you know, the answer is not simple. People talk for lots of reasons. People talk if they think they have something to sell. People talk if they think you're going to be fair. People talk if it's, if it's a more pleasurable experience than visiting the dentist. People talk because they're vain. And you think about it, it's, it's the, we don't have subpoena power as journalists. So thank God we have the vanity of people who think it's in their interest to talk to a journalist. And when they do talk, you do get to see the human side and are better able to pursue that human factor I mentioned. Finally, this is my final certitude, number 14, it's okay to be confused. All of us are nervous about how technology will alter our lives. And in fact, there are reasons to be nervous. Many of us are probably of two minds about the future. One part of my brain whispers to me, don't be a Luddite. Remember, Galileo was once attacked as subversive for insisting that the sun, not the earth, was the center 
of the universe. Remember the voice whispers in my mind. Remember all the false prophets. Remember the, those who said the telephone, the telephone would never replace the telegraph. Remember those who said that television would eliminate radio. And then, of course, television was going to eliminate the movie theater. Remember how the video store was going to kill the Hollywood studios. In fact, today, the video store is the single largest contributor of revenues to the Hollywood studios. Remember how it was once predicted that computers, in 1981 when I IBM introduced the PC, it was predicted that the computers would never achieve a mass market. Well, almost 40% of American homes now have computers. And yet the other part of my brain whispers to me, things like video on demand or online news is just a fad. This year's version of Cabbage Patch dolls or beta video players or the, remember the Apple, the Apple Newton, um, the personal digital assistant, handwriting recognition just about three years ago that was going to change the world. Instead, it lost John Scully his job as the head of Apple. Remember, when you think about technology, if you want to scroll through 500 channels, it would take you 43 minutes, one at a time, to scroll through 500 channels. Who wants to take their handheld computer to bed in order to read a book? So what does the future hold? Will we be watching our TV or our computer screens? Will all the instruments of the home be merged into one? Will we buy books off the internet? Will we have digital cash? Which of the seven giant communications companies will win? Who will lose? Will government act as a spectator or a referee? What will the consumer buy? It's actually a terrifying time because we don't know the answers to these and many other questions. And yet it's also exhilarating because the change is so fast and so interesting. But we're all guessing. Giant companies are guessing. Government is guessing. Reporters are guessing. In the end, we rely, we have to rely more on our instincts and our feelings than on hard facts. For the past five years, I've covered this industry, and I've talked to some of the smartest actors, be it Murdoch or Malone or Ted Turner or Jerry Levin or Frank Biondi. And yet none of them really knows the future. They can't. And yet most of them act as if they see it clearly. Which leads me to a final thought. The most fun I have as a journalist is when someone is talking with absolute certitude about the future or their business or what's going to happen next week or next year or next decade, I lean forward and I put on my best Columbo impersonation. And I say, huh? <laughs> and it usually actually exposes the folks. Thank you, and I'd love to take your questions. I use it for a number of, uh, on, I use a lot of email. Um, I'm online. Um, I found, for instance, I have a piece in the New Yorker this week um, uh, on Microsoft. And a fair number of interviews I, con I conducted through email. Um, I had, for instance, uh, so several exchanges with Bill Gates uh, for this piece. I needed his voice in the piece, and I couldn't see him. He was traveling, and we, we couldn't work it out. So I did questions. You know, I did uh, queries with him, and he, he responded to them. The weakness of email. I mean, the, I mean the, the positive email is that it's easy, and you can get to people you might not be able to get to, and obviously you can retrieve information from libraries and, and, and d other databases that, that uh, pretty easily. Um, the negative is you can't ask a follow-up question, and you can't see their face when you're asking the question, and you're giving them time to compose a response, and not surprising. The last one doesn't bother me as much. Because uh, I really want their response, and I could also ask a follow-up, which I did in Gates's case, to be sure I understood something or, or get him to be more explicit. 
But there are, there are limitations to email for me as a journalist, just as you'd much rather do an interview in person than on the phone with someone. Um, but I use it to retrieve information, email, talk to people. I don't, I have an email address, I don't give it out, I don't publish at the end of my uh, pieces of the New Yorker, and I don't on purpose, frankly. I mean, I can't answer the letters I get, and the thought that I'd spend my days just answering email queries just fills me with dread. Yes, sir? Yeah. Most of your illustrations uh, are related to consumer motivation. Consumers generally are motivated by advertising. How do you see the relation with all these new developments and their attraction to them by advertising? Well, I, I mean, I think advertising has got some real problems out, out there when you think about the future. I mean, technology, again, if I'm right, the technology is 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 an ally of more of a citizen than it is of giant companies. Though obviously, the advertisers use technology to figure out better figure out who their audience is, and they have the tools to do that in a much more targeted way. And in fact, can target their advertising in a way they couldn't before. But if I, as a consumer, uh, just as that clicker freed me from having to watch commercials. Um, so the technology, or the equivalent of clickers, frees me from having to watch certain things, um, be it on my computer or my TV. If I were an advertiser, and I realized that technology is not only doing that, but is also basically bifurcating the audience. That is to say, in, in, the, in the late 70s, or in 1980, 90% of the public on a given night was watching one of three networks. So if you wanted to introduce a new product or you were a, a company and you wanted to build up your brand name, you advertised on one of those three networks and you got you reached most of the eyeballs in the United States over a period of time. How do you reach all the eyeballs in the United States when people when you've got five hundred or five thousand channels and you also have, you know, computers and people on the internet? In fact, the the they attribute the, the drop in the last year, there was a, a big drop this year in network viewing. This is a steady decline. I wrote about this in that book she mentioned in, in introducing me, The Three Blind Mice. That is a steady decline. It was more of a, a drop in the last year, and it was because of, of um, online activity, a, a, a real growth in online activity which is siphoning people, particularly young people away from television viewing. So if I'm a, an advertiser, I'm sitting there and I'm scared. Because I'm saying, people can not only click me off, uh, but how do I reach a, a mass market in order to build up the brand awareness I need to compete in the cluttered, on a cluttered, uh, you know, uh, consumer uh, shelf space? So it's, it's a real problem. Now, obviously, there's going to be some real tie-ins where they're going to try and tie in. But they've tried this, for instance, in electronic publishing. Slate did this, and a number of other electronic magazines are doing it, where they say, well, let's do something with the advertiser. The advertiser will advertise in our electronic magazine. In fact, we'll allow them to go and click onto the site of the advertiser and leave our electronic magazine slide, uh, uh, site and come back to us. Well, then they're finding maybe they don't come back. And then the advertiser is saying, you know, how, what are we giving them, and is it worth worth it for us? And are there enough customers to do this? So there are real questions out there for advertising. I mentioned another one before, which is a huge one, which the government will get involved in, and all of us will get involved with the citizens in terms of our civil liberties. How much privacy do we want to cede in order to make it attractive for the advertiser? I mean, if you were Budweiser, you would love to know who the beer drinkers are, and just and just shoot your advertising at them. You'd save a lot of money. It'd be a very efficient buy. One of the ways to do that is to buy access to people who drink beer in their homes. How do you get that access? Time Warner has it. John Malone has it. Are they going to be allowed to sell it? Are we going to agree to sell it? Big questions. Um, 
Bill Gates, uh, like Bill Gates, like Warren Buffett. Well, but he says uh, Bill Gates, like Warren Buffett, says that that um, in fact he more than uh, Buff Buffett is just flat out cheap about <laughs> charitable giving, and he says I will give it all away when I die. I don't believe in leaving. I believe in 100 percent state tax. I won't leave anything for my kids. Gates is is actually given a little to Harvard. He's given it a little to Seattle Symphony and other charities, but his his charitable giving is is quite modest uh, compared to you know a man who worth 19 or 20 billion dollars in stock. Um, so um, his answer will be, I want to I want to see and make more intelligent. He's been asked the question about charitable giving, not by me but by others, and and uh, that's his answer. I want to wait and see. There are others. Mike Bloomberg, for instance, I did a piece on several months ago. His argument is that he gives away about 50 million dollars a year. And his argument is that, that I want to enjoy it. I enjoy giving charity, and why not do it while I'm alive? He, too, like Buffett, doesn't want to leave his kids uh, a big estate. But he thinks you give it away while you're, while you're functioning and you enjoy the giving, and you, and you enjoy the process of deciding where your money can be used most effectively. Um, there's an argument that is made to the consumer companies, and even conservatives like John Malone partially buy it, that they should be donating to computers to schools, and they are in many areas, uh, because they, they are starved for qualified people. And one of the ways you create a computer literate society, not just for customers, but also for potential employees, is to, is to see that by giving away some of, the, some of the technology. And some of these companies are doing that, and they're probably far-sighted to do that. Eighteen months. They say are very slow, so it would seem that th there should be an afterlife for these old computers. It's no big deal to give away something that's a little bit slow. But no, that's not just a thought of mine. My real question is, will the digital TV that the government is requiring in the next ten years uh, be better for this country than the old TVs that we have? They'll be more expensive. Um, Why well, the, well it, it depends on what the consumer gets. We don't know what the answer is to this. I, I'll tell you what you could get out of it. The, what they have figured out with digital technology and with what they call compression technology, right now you get your signals over a, a highway, and your highway is this wide. And to deliver a broadcast station signal, let's say it takes eight megahertz of space of that highway. So let's say you have a total in New York, let's say you have 12 lanes of eight megahertz each. They're saying that each of those lanes, and that's, you're limited to that. You can't get any more, your highway can't be expanded. There are houses or whatever on the side, you can't go any wider. But with compression technology, you can take that eight, that one lane highway and turn it in, transform it into six or seven lanes. That is to say, WCBS can become six or seven WCBSs on just that one signal because of compression technology and digitalization. So they're saying what, is, what has happened is that you each, the owner of a TV station has the ability to expand the number of channel choices he offers you to six or seven. So WCBS can have an all Spanish channel version of their news, or they could decide to give you internet access on it, or they can give you data or they can give you a business channel, or they can give you an all-weather local channel. They can just do various things. Or high-definition television, those pretty pictures they talk about, are so pristine, but they take a lot of space. They fill up the whole width of the highway just to deliver the high-definition pictures. So the choice, the government is saying, we will give you this space, you know, the, 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 the highway space. You decide whether you are going to give the consumer seven more channels for each one, or six or seven more channels for each one they have, or you're going to give them these pretty high-definition pictures. In any case, the television sets to, to be able to accept these high-definition digital pictures have to be much more sophisticated than they are today, much more expensive than they are today. The consumer, electron the consumer industry comes back and they say, Hey, wait a second. 
if we're going to do this, let's really have a real revolution and let's make sure that the television set can also be the computer. And they could be the same. And you could watch television on your computer or you can do computing on your television set. But let's have, let's have a smart machine. The consumer electronics companies, the Sonys and the others who sell traditional television sets, they say, hey, wait a second. We don't want the television set to be too complicated because things can go wrong as they do with computers, and that's the last thing that the consumer wants. The, cons the computer companies come back and say, no, wait, we can produce, instead of spending $5,000, which is what they say the first high-definition television sets will cost, they'll come down dramatically as computers and printers did when you have a mass market. They say we could do it a lot cheaper, but it's going to be a complicated system, and the pictures, some say, will not be as pretty. That is a huge battle that is going on right now as we speak. The resolution of that is not at all clear what's going to happen. But in any case, the consumer, you can envision a situation where you have your choice of many more channels uh, and, and giving you a lot more information, a lot of it local information. Or you can get, if you prefer, and if they find the economics for it, really wonderful high-definition pictures. But the truth is that these companies providing these services, they don't know whether we want those seven new or six new channels or high-definition pictures. They're guessing. And I suspect what they'll do is some kind of hybrid of the two. Sometimes they'll have, at 9 o'clock you may have a high-definition movie, and the rest of the day you may have some extra channel choices. Yeah, you know, the, uh, they actually project, uh, I have this in a piece that's in the current issue of The New Yorker, um, that um, the, the killer app on the internet will be business to business commerce. That the, that the surefire money maker is business to business. For instance, Dell Computer, which, which um, does a very good job of direct sales through catalogs, et cetera, they're now selling a million dollars a day a million dollars a day directly to the consumer on the internet. Cisco Systems is doing, I think it's five million dollars a day sales, intranet related kind of sales. They're projecting that, the Forrester Research projects that by the year 2000, business to business direct sales will be about 66 billion dollars on the internet. So when you think about it, what technology does, and this is the example I was citing before when I talked about Walmart, the great danger for any company, uh, and it could be a small company or a large company, is becoming the middleman, which is an extraneous person on the Internet. If the Internet fulfills its promise, or, and it need not be the World Wide Web, it could be, you know, within a business, what they call intranets, or some other online activity. What it really says is that you as a consumer can sit at home, and you don't have to go to a college campus to get an education, maybe. You can do distance learning on your computer. You could, uh, you, you could sit there and you could order from a, sto a bookstore, Amazon.com, to get your books, and you don't have to go to a bookstore. So what, it, what does Barnes & Noble have to be in business and spend all this rent? Which is one of the reasons why Barnes & Noble is now going to get in the online to compete against Amazon. But why do you have to go to Walmart when you could order your appliances directly from General Electric, which, by the way, is making hundreds of millions of dollars worth of sales uh, directly through the Internet. So you're saying uh, uh, the Wiz, you know, all of these, Egghead, all of these stores and chains are potentially middlemen, blockbuster video, potentially middlemen, and therefore they will get squeezed out. There's even an argument that, for instance, publishers may be middlemen. 
course, the value, as they say, the, the, the piece I wrote about this guy, Nathan Merville, who's the chief of technology at, at Microsoft, his argument is that brand is what counts. And who owns the brand? Well, the studio doesn't own the brand. When they make a movie, it, you don't go to that movie because it's a Sony or a Columbia or a Paramount movie. You go to see Tom Cruise or Martin Scorsese movie. And in a book, you go, you know, you read, you, you go, Tom Clancy's book, you don't look to see who's publishing that book. The same music, it, it, Madonna, it, it, Time Warner brings nothing to that party. It's, you buy not a Time Warner record but, or a CD, but a Madonna CD. So the brand is held, in that case, by the artist. Now, there are exceptions, and, 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 and these make it complicated. For instance, a Disney movie really has a brand, you know, you know, that's a value. You as a parent, if you have young kids, you're thinking about that Disney brand. And then if in the magazine business, you could argue there's a co-brand. The people, there are people who follow the New Yorker or Golf Digest and that they have a loyalty to that, but they may also know the writer. So there's a kind of a co-brand that goes with that. Now, it may be that Walmart can give you certain advantages. Or it may be that Blockbuster will try as they're trying, they'll introduce cappuccino machines and socials just as movie theaters are doing, to try and avoid becoming the squeezed middleman. But imagine, would you like to be a travel agent when you think 15 or 20 years from now? Well. More than prices, you could actually see hotel rooms, and this is all going to be available real soon. You can actually see the hotel room you'd stay at, and no, I don't like that, let me see another one. Or houses, instead of going out and shopping, you can actually see and visit apartments and, and get a sense of, I mean, you think about the consumer choices that, that would explode for you and the conveniences for you as a consumer. It's all possible. It is. There are, but there are, also, there are also problems. I mean, for instance, you as a consumer, uh, the idea that you could go to and look at a hotel uh, or look at apartments is very exciting. But you want one-stop service. You don't want to be, a, you don't want to go and click on to look at hotels, and then you got to click on to another icon to go look at, to make your hotel, not hotel, but your plane reservations, and, 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 and go to American Airlines versus Delta or whatever. There are complications. I remember, for instance, w when they introduced several years ago the notion that you could have a printer and a fax in the same machine. I got all excited. I needed a new printer and I needed a new fax. I said, this is great, combining all these instruments in the home. And in fact, people talk about this all the time today. All your instruments, including your cellular phone, you know, could all be in one instrument. But then you, when you think about that, I mean, that's business logic for you. It sounds great. What about human logic? And I, I went through the human logic when I went to the Wiz and I looked at the facts, the combined facts and, and, um, and printer. And I said to myself, what if the facts breaks? I lose my printer too, or vice versa. I, did, I went through the same process with a VCR and a television combined in one. If one breaks, I lose both. Well, if I have all the instruments in one, what if my cellular phone goes out? Do I lose my file of facts? You know, my computer. So it gets complicated. And again, it's still a mystery. We know that technology will be able to do many of these things. Will it be user friendly so that we are a, a mass audience, enough of a mass audience to make it economically worthwhile for these businesses to do it? I mean, Jerry Levin delivered on interactive TV. I mean, that's going to be here. They have some kinks, but essentially that will be delivered. The question is, do enough of us want that? And are we willing to pay enough to make it worthwhile for Jerry Levin and Time Warner to make the kind of investment they would have to make to make that a success, or at least to make it work to then test whether it would be a commercial success? So it's, again, we're really jumping off a bridge here, and we don't know whether there's water below us or concrete. And, uh, and I, always, I always think back to something Lewis Mumford once said. He was a great urban historian, and he said, I'm an optimist. Um, he, he said, I'm, I'm an optimist about probabilities 
and a pessimist. No, no, I got it wrong. I, I, he said, I'm a pessimist about probabilities and an optimist about possibilities. And I always thought that's not a bad way to look at, at this particular world. Have I exhausted you? No, I haven't. Um, one of the things that's interesting to me about, I guess especially the computer whole thing, is the, the amount of um, obsolescence. I mean, you buy hardware or software within a year or two, and obsolete, upgrade it, and you replace it. Um, it's my understanding, though, with Um, it is true that uh, I think you have, I think it's until the year 2006 um, to convert to high definition television. By the way, it's a huge expense for the, uh, for the broadcast companies too. They have to build new towers and I don't know whether you saw the piece in, I think it was Sunday's Times, it was a fascinating piece because there aren't enough people to build who are experienced and capable of building these 2,000 tall, feet tall um, towers. But yes, you will have to convert within nine years to uh, high definition, and it will be more expensive. The prices will drop as more people, customers come online, just as happened with computers. I think the public, you haven't heard a large outcry because I think the public probably doesn't quite understand it yet. It hasn't sunk in yet. Uh, but it will when people, these products are supposed to go on sale at Christmas of 98, if the optimists, if the consumer electronics companies are pledging this. If it does, and people then look at the price tag, uh, and if they're holding off now on buying new sets, which you probably should when you think about it, I mean, why buy a new set today if you're going to have to junk it uh, in two years, then you, you may hear an outcry. But by then, the decisions will have been made. Now, can they be reversed? Maybe. But it, it's, uh, I don't, th I, I think it's a murmur now. It's a quiet murmur. But it is, everything we have is potentially obsolete. Are there one or two indicators that you can follow to find out who the winner is going to be? For example, in the automobile business, they went through steam, they went through electric, gasoline, and then they all merged. The exact same thing is happening here. Uh, is there a touchstone that will give you the general direction, drift, of where the future is going? Where's Rupert? No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I, I mean, I am kidding, actually, because uh, I, I don't think he knows it either. I just think he's, he's got, he's a, he's a riverboat gambler, and he's got the guts to, to make bets. But Rupert Murdoch is not online. He doesn't know how to use a computer. He doesn't use one, actually. He's not technology conversant. Um, he has people who are. Uh, but he, he makes gut decisions, and he's got a reasonably good gut. If I knew the answer to that, I would be Bill Gates. Um, and and uh, I, I don't know the answer to that, and, and I don't know that Bill Gates knows the answer to that. Um, I mean, I would think, you know, the, the, there's a story that, that uh, it's another true story, and it took place in, um, in the late 80s, and Michael Eisner was at the Consumer Electronics Show. And he was walking through all and listen, watching all these appliances and get, getting really depressed. He, at the time, was a computer illiterate. He's not now. He's online now. But at the time, I, I know this only because I've heard it because he doesn't speak to me anymore because of the things I wrote in that book. But in any case, he's, um, at the time, he was computer illiterate, and he wasn't conversant at all with, with uh, technology. But he goes to the Consumer Electronics Show, and he really gets depressed as he strolls through these, so these arcades of these wondrous machines and handheld devices. 
and they say, my God, they're just going to kill Disney and we're just going to get squeezed out and why aren't we in some of these businesses and this is a terrible, it's going to be a disaster. And then he heard the voice of Arnold Schwarzenegger on the screen. And Arnold Schwarzenegger in German, and Arnold Schwarzenegger in French, and Arnold Schwarzenegger in English. And he realized like that Barney ad, they all need product. In Barney, they all need pants. And, and you know, it's like Levi Strauss. I mean, the only person who made money on the, on, on the gold rush in the last century was who <laughs> sold pants to the miners. And the, the truth is that, that, that um, software is certainly one answer to this, because everyone is going to need product. Um, that's why Microsoft, which now wants to get in what they call the content business, which is really the entertainment or information business, they realize that they don't understand that business, and that, that's why they do an alliance with NBC for MSNBC or do or hire Michael Kinsley to do an electronic magazine. But they're trying to figure out, but they know the content is key. And I think content is certainly there. Uh, are distribution systems important? Right now they're more important than they will be in 20 years. Uh, but I don't know whether these seven or eight industries as we talked about, it's not knowable which of them will merge or whether telephone company might not be delivering the content. Or maybe the consumer electronics, maybe Sony will finally achieve what they failed to achieve when they bought Columbia Pictures and marry the hardware and the software. But clearly anyone trying to be in the information, data, entertainment business, uh, you need content. You need some access to the content providers. So that's a given. But having said that, we're not really saying that much because you don't know who's going to be paying for the content. And for instance, agents, the Hollywood agents, you can make an argument that what do you need the studios for? that they're a middleman. Why do they have to package the movies? That's all they're doing is packaging. They're not making the movies. A producer, and director, and actors are making it, and writers. Well, you know, why don't we just go directly to the agents and let them package it, and the phone company can do that and do it. I mean, you can make that argument. Business logic says that this is possible, that squeeze out the studio is a typical kind of middleman. Will that happen? I doubt it, but it could. But it's not knowable. And, and, and so that's why people make hunches and lose a lot of money. And some make a lot of money. And Netscape looks brilliant when its stock is at 100 plus 100. And today when its stock is in, in the teens, it doesn't look so brilliant. But maybe it'll come back. Who knows? Thank you. I've kept you long enough. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.